Morning, church. It's wonderful to be here. Hello, everybody online. Um, how's the sound? Is the feedback okay there? Um, how's those songs, eh? Yes, uh, you know, God fights our battles and He's a, a wonder-working God, and that's, that's really what we're going to be chatting about tonight. So um, I just want to say, everybody, Do uh, Johnny said they're going to be watching from Botswana. I'm very sad for Cindy and them because the car apparently broke down, so... There's a whole group that couldn't go. Um, I want to say welcome to my wife. She's watching from uh, Namibia. She went this weekend. She can't make it here uh, today. She uh, sends her apologies. Um, she was ministering to a group of ladies in Namibia for the whole of Saturday. And I just want to honor you and love you. You're incredible and God is using you like you won't believe. Um, I'm seeing her this afternoon, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> So what's up with the band? Lebs, you guys were incredible, really. Thank you, thank you. And, um, and I believe for, for absolute miracles today. So we're preaching through the battles of the Bible. And, um, and how great are these songs, you know, that God wants to fight our battles and do miracles in our lives. And do we really, really, really actually believe that? And um, I'm going to be talking today about the strangest battle that has ever happened in the Bible. And my sermon is, um, is titled... <clears throat> What do we do when we feel overwhelmed? Because that's something that we hear quite often. Um, you often hear from people, I'm just so overwhelmed. Um, and there are many things that we can be overwhelmed about. Many things. News. There's just too much news. There's too much emails. There's too much social media. There's so many things that's happening in this world, especially now with the information age, that you, know, you often hear that people just say, I'm just so overwhelmed. But then there are serious stuff that we can be overwhelmed about. We can be overwhelmed about our finances. We can be overwhelmed by our relationships, about marriages, you know, marriages that's just not working. We can be overwhelmed by our struggles, you know, things that we really, really struggle about. The Bible says, you know, we can be overwhelmed by regret, we can be overwhelmed by worry, we can be overwhelmed by fear and resentment and, and unforgiveness and all of those things. And, and let's just be honest, you know, life can be quite tough. Life gets flippant tough sometimes. And... Um, so the story starts at 2 Chronicles 20, and it's, a, it's about a guy called King Jehoshaphat. Now, imagine your name was called Jehoshaphat, you know? I think they, they let's, let's just call him Japhat for now. Hey, Japhat, yo, fatty. Yo, Mr. Fatty, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a, was a very good king. He was a good king. He was a, he was a good guy. And if you read 2 Chronicles 19, you'll see what he actually did and how he raised up Israel and how he cleaned out the temples and how he destroyed all the, the false gods and everything. And he, he, um, he asked the country to bring their tithing into, he was really, really, I mean, what he used to do was he used to go to all the small little towns. He didn't stay with the who's who's and he was just in his palace and the temple and everything. He went to the little guy in the towns and he really brought about a spiritual revival. There was a spiritual rebirth in Israel. And when you finish chapter 19, you'll see about all these great, wonderful things that he does. Suddenly, chapter 20 starts where he's now getting attacked. And I don't know if you've ever felt like it, you know, where you're kind of obedient to God, and you love God, and you honor Him, and you do all these wonderful things, and you read the Bible, and you're in His Word, and all of a sudden, you just get attacked from all sides. And you go, God, I am doing what you want me to do, and it seems like my whole world is flipping, falling apart. And... Um, so, 2 Chronicles 19, um, verse 4, it talks about how Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem. He went out among the people from Beersheba to the hill of Ephraim and turned them back to the Lord. And, you know, I don't know about you, but every single time in my life I kind of experience something good, it almost feels like there's the day after. There's this bad kind of thing that happens. You know, there's always the day after, the day after Christmas, the day after the big event, the Springboks have won, you know, or, or they lost, or... Um, uh, you know, it, it almost seems like for every valley, or for every mountain top that you get to, there's always this, this kind of valley. And that's how God kind of designed it, because with every great blessing that you receive in your life, there will be a testing. It just happens like that. There will always be a testing. And, and the other thing is, you know, when you decide that you want to do something good for God, there's somebody that's not going to like it. That's just how it is. You've got an enemy, enemy is Satan, and a friend of God is an enemy of Satan. So, so kind of this is where the story takes off. Um, there were these three tribes, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Munites from Mount Seir that kind of got together and they wanted to destroy Jehoshaphat. There was also 
the frostbites and the crystallites and the termites. <laughs> there were the parasites, which was also there. Um, the muites couldn't do anything. They were the, the, the sheep or the, the goats. And the Jedi Knights were the most dangerous, but they, they, <laughs> but they, 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 they weren't there at the time. There were also no socialites, okay? So, <laughs> but anyway, so these armies are coming together, trying, you know, wanting to destroy him. And Chronicles 20 verse 2 to 3 says, Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea, a vast army. It wasn't a small tribe, it was vast. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. So, um, I hope you guys have got uh, something to write on, or maybe use your cell phones and stuff, because what I want to teach you today is the exact five things. The five things that Jehoshaphat did when he felt overwhelmed is exactly the five things that you need to do when you get overwhelmed. And what is so incredible about every single battle in the Bible is God gives us a blueprint of what we should do, certain principles, certain things that we should do in order to fight our battles. Um, and I want to say to you, you know, a battle can either intimidate you or it can motivate you to pray more. So when you get overwhelmed with problems, let it motivate you to pray. And here are the five things that, that Jehoshaphat did in order for him to, to to win this battle. So the first thing he does is he turns to God. That's the first thing he does. He doesn't turn to the television. He doesn't turn to a psychologist. He doesn't turn to a psychiatrist. He doesn't turn to social media or to Google or phone a friend or phone the pastor. Nothing wrong with that stuff. Nothing. But the first thing he does is he decides to turn to God. Prayer should always be your first choice, turning to God. It's so crazy when you speak to people and they say, you know, when the ship sings and all else fail, now we can just pray to God. You know, or we've tried everything. The only thing that is left is prayer. And it should never be your last option. It should be your first option. So he turns to God and, um, and he knows that his rear, his butt is not really going to get kicked in, you know. And um, so verse 4 says, The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard, and prayed. Now let me tell you, that's leadership. That is incredible leadership. I think we need that more in our country. Because what happens is when we get overwhelmed, the first thing we start doing is we start planning. And there's nothing wrong with planning, okay? But you should pray before you plan. And I mean, think about it in South Africa. If the leaders just come together and say, let's just stop our planning and our politics and everything else, and let's just pray to God. The entire country came together to pray. Um, you know, because no problem, it's not, you know, if, if a problem is big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. If a problem is small enough to worry about, it is small enough to pray about. Um, but I wanna, what, what I want to teach you today is the four things that he prayed, what he prayed, and how he did it. And this is the exact same thing that we need to do when we pray to God and when we go to God. And it's not a legalistic thing. I just want to make that sure. It's not like you've got to follow these steps to do it. But there's a principle in this that I, that I want to teach you. So the first thing he does is he, he turns to God. That's the first thing he does. The second thing he does is, in his prayer, is he focuses on God and, and not on the problem. And he does this through his prayer. And there's four things in his prayer that he prays about. He says, are you not, did you not, did you not, and will you not? Okay? So, um, have you ever... Um, you know, when you ask people and you say to them, listen, how, how are you? And people say, no, no, I'm good under the circumstances. Of a good under the omstandigheden and stuff. Why do you want to be under your circumstances? You want to be on top of your circumstances. There's a great writer called Tim Boone. He says, um, he says, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look inside of yourself, you'll be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. And so he makes a, a conscious decision that in his prayer, that when he prays to God, he's going to focus on God and he does four things. The first thing he does is, as he prays, he remembers how big God is. Verse 6, he says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. So what he does is he reminds himself how powerful God is, how in control God is. All things are possible with God. And he reminds God that, that he's bigger than the problem. 
Because if you make, the bigger you make God, the smaller your problems will be. If you expand God, your problems are just going to become smaller. So that's the first thing he does. The second thing he does is um, he reminds himself and he remembers what God has done in the past. In verse 7 he says, <clears throat> Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? So what he's doing is he's recalling and he's recollecting. You know, what you've done in the past. And when I look back, when I go and, I, and they, I, I'm faced with a situation, I think back on my life of how many times God has come through in my life. How many times He has saved me. How many times He has rescued me. Even the times when I wasn't with Him and I wasn't saved. How His hand was always kind of with me. And I recall that. Um, because what he's actually saying is, you know, he says, God, you know, you've brought us this far. You're not going to leave us now. And a lot of people think when I'm saved and when I'm, you know, with God and some kind of God has done this one thing now and he's just left me. There's nothing more for God to do. Now I kind of have to fight my battles and go forward. And that's not the case at all. That's not the case. God has not brought you to this place to leave you now. He's got incredible things waiting for all of us. And, um, I mean, he says, you know, God, you, you led us out of Egypt at the time you brought us to the promised land, what do we have to do now? Um, so he says, I know who you are, how mighty you are, and I know what you've done. And then he reminds God of a few things that God has done. God has saved us from the past. He saved us from disasters, from pandemics, from famine, from hunger. You know, God has done that for me and God has done that for you. And the third thing what he does is he remembers <clears throat> what God has promised now, did you know there's over 7,000 promises in the Bible? Do you know what is a telltale sal s s sign if you, if you don't know the promises? You worry. If you worry, it means that you don't know the promises of God. You might have read it somewhere, but you haven't memorized it. It's not part of who you are. It's not part of your being. It's not part of your thoughts. It's not part of your life. And if you don't memorize the Word of God, you are going to worry. But if you know the promises of God, you know... You're going to live a life of, of victory. Um, and because he says in verse 7, you know, God, you have promised us this land. You've brought us this far. Why will, you, why will you leave us now? And then the fourth thing he does is he appeals to God's character. Um, it says, but now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were the three tribes who wanted to come and destroy them, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? And so what Josephat is doing is he's appealing to God's character. He says, God, aren't you a fair God? Aren't you just? Aren't you going to deliver your promises? Because just a little uh, uh, backstory. So John spoke about the battle of Egypt and going through the Red Sea and the Egyptians and everything about three weeks ago and stuff. And, and he spoke about when, when the Israelites left Egypt, they were on their way to the promised land. And they got to a point where God said, no, 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 don't go the short way. I want you to go the, the long way around. And the reason he wanted them to go the long way around, because there were these three tribes. And this was years before the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Munites. They were there. And God said, don't go there. Don't fight them. Don't destroy them, whatever. You know, you're going to take a detour. Hundreds of years later, these little three tribes are now massive, huge armies. They didn't destroy them then. Now these guys are coming to attack me. And he goes to God and he says, God, this is the promised land. You gave this to us. This is your promise. Are you not just? Are you not going to destroy them? We didn't destroy them then. And now these guys are coming to us and they're coming to destroy us. So you turn to God and you go to God and you say, God, I know that you are big. I know that you are huge, okay? You've helped me in the past, you know, what he's done for you in the past. I know what you've promised me, so now today, God, I'm calling you on your promises. I want you to fulfill your character, you know? I'm going to focus on you. So the third thing he does is, so we've got the first one, you turn to God. It's your decision. You don't turn to anything else. You turn to God. Then you focus on God when you pray. So he doesn't focus on the problem. He focuses on God. God, you're big. God, you're awesome. God, you've done these things in the past. You've helped me, Lord Jesus. You've promised all of these things, Lord Jesus. Are you not going to do this now? So you focus on God. You don't look at the problem. And then step three, what you do is you admit your inability, your absolute powerlessness. 
Now that is the first step of any 12-step program. I've been involved in the 12-step program for the last 20 years of my life. I was in uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Sex and Love Addiction Anonymous, Codependency Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. All the steps are exactly the same except the first step. The first step in and the 12-step program, it says, we admitted we're powerless over addiction or powerless over alcohol or powerless over people, places, and things or powerless over my, you know, and my life has become un uh, unmanageable. Now, a lot of people think that's a weak thing. It's not weakness. Because through your powerlessness, that's when you get empowered. It means you surrender. You just absolutely surrender. You put up the white flag and say, God, I can't fight anymore. I don't know how, how this is going to happen. I'm powerless. And maybe you felt like this. You're powerless in your career. You're powerless with your marriages. You're powerless with your finances. And you're just kind of fighting and fighting and fighting. And God wants you just to say, listen, just accept your powerlessness. Because in verse 12, he says, he says, For we have no power to face the vast army that is attacking us. We do not, do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah, with their wives and children and little ones, stood there before the Lord. And, um, and this is just so incredible. This entire nation comes together and they, they proclaim their dependence upon God. And I want, to write, I want you guys to write this down, whoever is, is, is writing this. <clears throat> Did you know that you, you don't have to know all the key men in the world if you know the man who holds all the keys? You don't have to manipulate to get that promotion. You don't have to, you know, kind of walk on eggshells around people because you want people to behave in a certain way. You don't have to do that. You don't have to not be yourself in a relationship where you think, mm, you know what? You don't have to do those things. You don't have to be controlling. You don't have to be manipulative. Because it's not your battle. You're not going to win. You're just going to tire yourself out. God wants to win the battle. And how does God respond when you do these three things? So when you do these three things, you focus on Him, you pray to Him, you know, and, um, and you accept your inability. What does God do? God go, comes to you and He says, okay, I want you to relax. That's what He does. I'm fighting the battle. It's not your battle. Most of you guys are all so freaking tired because you are fighting your own battles. You know, you're walking around and say, if it's up to me, you know, if it's to be, it's up to me. That's kind of what we do because we're brought up in a world that we have to fight for everything. We've got to move forward. If we don't conquer by ourselves, who's, who's going to do it? And we are such fixers. I was a massive fixer. Oh, my word. I was such a people pleaser. Yin that dog. Oh, I just wanted to fix everybody. And I want to fix people's emotions. And I wanted to feel better about, because if I can fix your emotion, then I'll feel better about me. And I wanted to fix relationships and hunt the care and everything. You know, you want to fix everybody else's faults. I couldn't even fix, I can't even fix my own faults. How are you going to go about and try and fix somebody else's faults? You can't do that. And, um, and then eventually kind of what happens, inevitably, you know, we kind of crawl back to God and we say, God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, you know, because I let you down. And then God says, you didn't let me down because you never held me up. <laughs> you know, we don't hold God up. We don't. He holds us up. You know, you don't help God. God helps you. You don't help God. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you to go and help and fix and do everything. He doesn't need you to do that. He helps you. We're not perfect. He's perfect. We don't have to be perfect. That's why Jesus came and died and we're covered by His blood. Um, and that is why we are the righteousness of God. But anyway, so, and oh, just quickly, by the way, now that we're talking about, you know, if you've got a dream for your life, you know, you've got a dream for your life and your dream is so small that you think you don't need God, don't need God's help, you've got a stinking little puny dream. This next one. If you think you're going to go through your life and you don't ever speak to God, you don't need God, there's people that do that. And they're quite successful and they carry on, but they, let me tell you, your life is this small. And it's actually, it's, it's sad to see because you have to have a focus and a dream that is so big that you are bound to fail. You will fail. You can't achieve this thing without God's help. Um... <laughs> Do you know how most people fight their battles? It's like you're on this massive cruise ship, right? You know those big cruise ships? I've been on one of those MEC cruise ships once in my life. Oh, never again. Never again, okay? But uh, yeah, we only went from Cape Town to Derbs, okay? That was it. I saw the shoreline on the side. There was no excitement. I just stood there and I saw the shoreline. And it was really... And all the people did on that 
bus, or well, the bus uh, on the ship was drink. That's all they did. They were just drunk every single night. But anyway, so what most people do is they're on, these, it's on a cruise ship bigger than that. Huge, huge. And you're kind of on the side of the ship at the bottom. Somehow you got maybe into a little lifeboat on the side of the ship, and you're in the water, and you're doing this. <laughs> and people are saying to you, listen, what are you doing? And you're saying, I'm helping the ship to sail. I can't have to go. And people say, you don't have to do it. The ship is actually, actually it's huge. It's massive. It's not going to sink if you don't do it. No. No, I have to. I have to. The ship is going to sink if I don't do this. That's what most people do. And eventually, you, you only got to carry on doing that for like, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes. And you're going to get tired. You're going to go, oh. And that's when God, when God says, listen, thank, thank you. You've given up. Now I can do something. Finally, you've stopped. You know? Because you think you are making the ship go. You're not making the ship go. You are not in control. God is in control. And only when you get so freaking tired of doing that, God can actually come in and say, okay, great. You've surrendered. Now we can, now we can do something. So this is really a, a freaking strange battle. I love the story. So verse 17 to 18, God says to him, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. So Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Notice they worshipped rather than worried. They prayed. They didn't panic. You can choose. Panic or prayer. Worship or worry. So what he says is he says, he says don't fight. He says, don't fight. He says to all of us, that's what God is actually saying. You can resign as general manager from the world. Because that's kind of what we think we often do. You know, we are general managers and we want to rule, rule the world. He says, don't fight. And he says, don't move. Stand. And that standing means it's a quiet confidence. That's what that standing means. Do you know that sometimes it takes more courage not to do something than to actually do something? God wants you to stand still. And it's, I believe, I believe it's never God's will for us to run from a difficult situation. Never. Never, never, never. I believe that. I believe God never wants us to run from a difficult situation. Because if we run, that situation will come our paths again. It's going to cross our paths again. And he says, don't worry. He says, don't worry. He says it twice. And when God says something twice, he really, really means it. Um, because I don't know if you've noticed, but has, has God ever lost a battle? Has God ever lost a battle? Never. We're on the winning side. I read the last chapter of the book. Of course, life goes through this stuff. Do you know that there's not one dictator that lasts? Not one. But at the time when Nero was king, people thought he was God. Who's Nero today? It's a cat's name. You know? It's the name of a cat. I don't know. So, and God w wants us to do two things while we're standing. So, in verse 20, it says, Joseph had stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets, and you will be successful. Two things most people want in life is success and stability. Don't you want that? Success and stability. And God says here, in that verse, God says, Trust in my character, trust in who I am, and trust in my word. The prophets at the time. Trust in my character, who I am, and trust in my word. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. God will bless you. You just need to trust Him completely. And then, number four. What does He do? He thanks God in advance. That's the fourth thing. You thank God in advance. Verse 21 says, After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Now, this is quite pretty bizarre, okay? So you've got Israel here, and you've got the king, you've got Jehoshaphat, and, uh, and um, you know, on this side, you've got the Ammonites, and the Moabites, and the Jedinites, and everybody that wants to kind of destroy them, and what God says to Jehoshaphat is, when you march out, right at the front, put the choir, the maniki is what sing, sit for lebo or lefoor, you know? So for level four, they don't, they're not going to go out with any weapons, not even a stick, okay? And then you've got the band behind them, and then you've got the army, and you're going to march out. Now, just imagine this. So these guys are standing, and they're looking at this battle, and they go, what the hell is Flippin going on, okay? These guys are going, the fighters at the back saying, 
yeah, what is going on? You know? <laughs> and then you've got this choir in the middle goes, God, we really want to know what is going on because we are like, we're marching into battle and we've got nothing. We've got drumsticks. Okay? And what this is, is, is thanking God, is a symbol, okay, of thanking God in advance. Now I want to ask you a question quickly. How, when last did you thank God for the miracle that He's done in your life? Because let me tell you, when you thank God in advance, that's the highest form of faith. When you thank God, when He answers a, a, a prayer, that's gratitude. And you say, thank you, God. That's gratitude. When you're thanking God in advance, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it, what's the word? It demonstrates your faith in God. Because let me tell you how most people pray. Most people go to God and go, God, please, pretty please, I'm praying for this God, and I, and I really want this, and I really want this. And then you, they go and they beg God, and they pester God, and they flip and they try and manipulate God, and they bargain with God and everything. And I think eventually God just goes, okay, man, you saw. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? God wants to give you His blessings. He wants to give you all, all, all these things. But, but here's the thing. While you're working on your prayer, God is working on you. God is not a vending machine. Not a vending machine. Vending machines are bad. Put money in, get just, I won't say crap, out of the vending machine. Okay? Because this prayer is not really about Jehoshaphat and how he prayed. It's while he was praying these things, God was doing something in his heart. God knew exactly what Jehoshaphat wanted. But when we pray, I ask God for something once, twice, maybe three times. And I think that's a bit. And then I start thanking God for the answer because I know that the answer is coming. Um, now let me show you the power of praise and thanks. Verse 22, As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. That's freaking brilliant. That's brilliant. They started thanking God. And what God did was created confusion amongst those tribes, and they started destroying themselves. They didn't have to pick up as much as a flippin' bow or arrow, and they were destroyed. Um, and there's a final step, and this is, this is probably my, 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 it's the fifth step. That is, that's, um, for me, probably the most exciting step is that, is that two things happen. You find the blessing in the victory. You'll find the blessing in the victory. Verse 24 to 26 says, when the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the valley of Baraka to this day. So what happened was there were so much spoils, there were so many dead bodies, it took them three days to run in, get the loot, and share that with one another. And the valley of Baraka, in Hebrew, it means the valley of blessing. That's what Baraka means. God doesn't want us to live in the valley of battles, of the battle, of the battle. He wants us to live in the valleys of Baraka, in the valleys of of blessing, um, because he wants to share so much stuff with you that you can't just keep everything for yourself. You have to share it with people. Um, verse 27, then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They didn't earn it. They didn't fight for it. They didn't work for it. They didn't have to do anything in order to win this battle, and that's what Jesus has given to us. We don't get to heaven because we earn it or fight for it or work for it. We get it because of God's grace, and God wants to fight your battles for you because He loves you, and it's just because of who He is. It's not because of, of what we do. So the first thing is, we get all the spoils of the battle. Massive blessings. And I'm telling you now, God wants to bless you in your life. Incredibly. He wants to bless you so much it's not even funny. But the second thing that happens is people notice around us, whether it's Christians or whether it's non-Christians. They notice and they go, oh my word, wow, something incredible happened. Because God wants to show us His splendor and His greatness. When something like that happens, people notice. They go, shush, that is incredible. 
It says, Yet the fear of God came into all the surrounding kingdoms, and they heard now the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel, and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. And I believe everybody in life, anybody wants peace and security. And I don't know what you're struggling with at the moment. I don't know what your battles are. We all have certain battles. Um, but I want to say, you know, bless you. Really, in whatever it is that you are going through. When you're faced with a battle, that's what you do. You turn to God first. You focus on God. You pray to Him. You remind yourself of who God is, what He's done in the past, His promises. You know His character. Read the Word. Understand who God's character is. You accept your inability to do things. You can stop fighting. You can surrender. And you can enjoy the spoils of the Father. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Father, that we can come together as a church, Lord. Thank you, Father, that as we walk out of here, that you've equipped us, Lord, to really just build your kingdom, give hope to people, Father, share your word with people. That's why we are called, Lord, to this earth. It's not about our lives anymore, Lord, because we have died and you live in us and through us, Father. Thank you that you've blessed us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you that we know that when we turn to you, Father, and we turn to you first, <clears throat> and we pray to you that you, will, that you will bless us, Lord, that you want to fight our battles for us, Lord, that we can actually just sit and relax and start resting, Father, to know that we are not in control of the things happening around us, Father. I want to pray for this church. I want to pray for our people, Lord. There's so much happening outside at the moment. The world is broken. There are so many things happening. It, it almost seems, it seems overwhelming to so many of us, Father. But may we just go and sit at your feet and relax and soak up your word. Sit with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and know that you are there to help us, to protect us, and to bless us, Father. And that we can call upon your promises and your character, Father, because you are who you are. You're the same God as yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Father. The same God, Father, who led the Israelis out, Lord, that took us from slavery, given us a new life. You died for us, Father. We are justified. We are covered by your blood. We are in right standing with you, Lord Jesus. We are acquitted, Lord. When you look at us, you see Jesus, Father. Thank you that we don't have to do anything, uh, 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 be something that we don't have to be, Father. Thank you that there's, we don't have to try and, and earn your love, Lord, or deserve your love because it is undeserving. It is all by your grace and because of the cross of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You might be asking yourself the question, how can I take this further? Firstly, you can send us your contact details to cindy at centerchurch.co.za where we can include you in our online connect groups and you can receive our daily devotional. Secondly, you can hop on our website where you can access previous sermons and find out more about who we are at Center Church. Thirdly, if you consider yourself as part of Center Church, we want to thank you so much for your ongoing financial partnership. The banking details are on the website. Thank you so much for joining us and hope you have an amazing Sunday.